Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe Chapter 9 A Boat But first I was to prepare more land, for I had now seed enough to sow above an acre of ground. Before I did this I had a week's work at least to make me a spade, which when it was done was but a sorry one indeed, and very heavy and required double labor to work with it. However, I got through that and sowed my seed in two large flat pieces of ground, as near my house as I could find them to mind, and fenced them in with a good hedge, the stakes of which were all cut off that wood which I have set before, and knew it would grow, so that in a year's time I knew I should have a quick or living hedge that would want but little repair. This work did not take me up less than three months, because a great part of that time was the wet season, when I could not go abroad. Within doors, that is, when it rained and I could not go out, I found employment in the following occupations, always observing that all the while I was at work I diverted myself with talking to my parrot and teaching him to speak, and I quickly taught him to know his own first name, and at last to speak it out pretty loud, Pow, which was the first word I ever heard spoken in the island by any mouth but my own. This, therefore, was not my work, but an assistance to my work, for now, as I said, I had a great employment upon my hands, as follows. I had long studied to make, by some means or other, some earthen vessels, which, indeed, I wanted sorely, but knew not where to come at them. However, considering the heat of the climate, I did not doubt, but if I could find out any clay, I might make some pots that might, being dried in the sun, be hard enough and strong enough to bear handling, and to hold anything that was dry, and required to be kept so. And as this was necessary in the preparing of corn, meal, etc., which was the thing I was doing, I resolved to make some as large as I could, and fit only to stand like jars, to hold what should be put into them. It would make the reader pity me, or rather laugh at me, to tell how many awkward ways I took to raise this paste. What odd, misshapen, ugly things I made, how many of them fell in, and how many fell out, the clay not being stiff enough to bear its own weight, how many cracked by the over-violent heat of the sun, being set out too hastily, and how many fell in pieces with only removing, as well before as after they were dried, and in a word, how, after having labored hard to find the clay, to dig it, to temper it, to bring it home, and work it, I could not make above two large earthen ugly things, I cannot call them jars, in about two months' labor. However, as the sun baked these two very hard and dry, I lifted them very gently up, and set them down again in two great wicker baskets, which I had made on purpose for them, that they might not break. And as between the pot and the basket there was a little room to spare, I stuffed it full of the rice and barley straw, and these two pots be being to stand always dry, I thought would hold my dry corn and perhaps my meal when the corn was bruised. Though I miscarried so much in my design for large pots, yet I made several smaller things with better success, such as little round pots, flat dishes, pitchers, and pipkins, and any things my hand turned to, and the heat of the sun baked them quite hard. But all this would not answer my end, which was to get an earthen pot to hold what was liquid and bear the fire which none of these could do. It happened, after some time, making a pretty large fire for cooking my meat, when I went to put it out after I was done with it, I found a broken piece of one of my earthenware vessels in the fire, burnt as hard as a stone, 
and red as a tile. I was agreeably surprised to see it, and said to myself, that certainly they might be made to burn whole, if they would burn broken. This set me to study how to order my fire, so as to make it burn some pots. I had no notion of a kiln, such as the potters burn in, or of glazing them with lead, though I had some lead to do it with, but I placed three large pipkins and two or three pots in a pile, one upon another, and placed my firewood all around it, with a great heap of embers under them. I plied the fire with fresh fuel round the outside and upon the top, till I saw the pots in the inside red-hot quite through, and observed that they did not crack at all. When I saw them clear red, I let them stand in that heat about five or six hours, till I found one of them, though it did not crack, did melt or run, for the sand which was mixed with the clay melted by the violence of the heat, and would have run into glass if I had gone on. So I slacked my fire gradually till the pots began to abate of the red color, and watching them all night, that I might not let the fire abate too fast. In the morning I had three very good, I will not say handsome, pipkins, and two other earthen pots, as hard burnt as could be desired, and one of them perfectly glazed with the running of the sand. After this experiment I need not say that I wanted no sort of earthenware for my use, but I must need say, as to the shapes of them, they were very indifferent, and as any one may suppose, when I had no way of making them but as the children make dirt pies, or as a woman who would make pies that never learned to raise paste. No, no joy at a thing of so mean a nature was ever equal to mine, when I found I had made an earthen pot that would bear the fire, and I had hardly patience to stay till they were cold before I set one on the fire again with some water in it to boil me some meat, which it did admirably well, and with a kind of piece of a kid I made some very good broth. Though... I wanted oatmeal and several other ingredients requisite to make it as good as I would have had it been. My next concern was to get me a stone mortar to stamp or beat some corn in, for as to the mill there was no thought of arriving at that perfection of art with one pair of hands. To supply this want I was at a great loss. For of all the trades in the world, I was as perfectly unqualified for a stone cutter as for any whatever. Neither had I any tools to go about it with. I spent many a day to find a great stone big enough to cut hollow and make fit for a mortar, and could find none at all except what was in the solid rock, and which I had no way to dig or cut out nor indeed were the rocks in the island of hardness sufficient, but were all of a sandy, crumbling stone, which neither could bear the weight of a heavy pestle, nor would break the corn without filling it with sand. So, after a great deal of time lost in searching for a stone, I gave it over, and resolved to look out for a great block of hard wood, which I found, indeed, much easier and getting one as big as I had strength to stir, I rounded it and formed it on the outside with my axe and hatchet, and then, with the help of fire and infinite labor, made a hollow place in it, as the Indians in Brazil make their canoes. After this, I made a great heavy pestle, or beater, of the wood called the ironwood, and this I prepared and laid by against I had my next crop of corn which I proposed to myself grind, or rather pound into meal, to make bread. My next difficulty was to make a sieve, or searce, to dress my meal, and to part it from the brand and the husk, without which I did not see it possible I could have any bread. This was a most difficult thing even to look upon, for, to be sure, I had nothing like the necessary thing to make it. I mean, 
fine thin canvas or stuff to searce the meal through. And here I was at a full stop for many months, nor did I really know what to do. Linen I had none left but what was mere rags. I had goat's hair, but neither knew how to weave or to spin it. And had I known how, here were no tools to work it with. All the remedy that I found was this, that at last I did remember I had among the seamen's clothes, which were saved out of the ship, some neckcloths of calico or muslin, and with some pieces of these I made three small sieves proper enough for the work, and thus I made shift for some years. How I did afterwards, I shall show in its place. The baking part was the next thing to be considered, and how I should make bread when I came to have corn. For first, I had no yeast. As to that part, there was no supplying the want. So I did not concern myself much about it. But for an oven, I was indeed in great pain. At length, I found out an experiment for that also, which was this. I made some earthen vessels, very broad, but not deep, that is to say about two feet diameter and not above nine inches deep. These I burned in the fire, as I had done the other, and laid them by. And when I wanted to bake, I made a great fire upon my hearth, which I had paved with some square tiles of my own baking and burning also. But I should not call them square. When the firewood was burned pretty much into embers or live coals, I drew them forward upon this hearth so as to cover it all over, and there I let them lie till the hearth was very hot. Then, sweeping away all the embers, I set down my loaf or loaves, and, whelming down the earthen pot upon them, drew the embers all round the outside of the pot to keep in and add to the heat. And thus as well as in the best oven in the world, I baked my barley loaves, and became in little time a good pastry cook into the bargain, for I made myself several cakes in puddings of the rice. But I had no pies, neither had I anything to put them in, supposing I had, except the flesh either of fowls or goats. It need not be wondered, as if all these things took up most of my time of the third year of my abode here. For it is to be observed that in the interval of these things I had my new harvest and husbandry to manage, for I reaped my corn in its season, and carried it home as well as I could, and laid it up in the ear, in my large baskets, till I had time to rub it out, for I had no floor to thrash it upon, or instrument to thrash it with. And now, indeed, my stock of corn increasing, I really wanted to build my barns bigger, I wanted a place to lay it up in, for the increase of the corn now yielded me so much that I had of the barley about twenty bushels, and of the rice as much or more, insomuch that now I resolved to begin to use it freely, for my bread had been quite gone a great while. Also I resolved to see what quantity would be sufficient for me a whole year, and to sow but once a year. Upon the whole, I found that the forty bushels of barley and rice were much more than I could consume in a year, so I resolved to sow just the same quantity every year that I sowed the last, in hopes that such a quantity would fully provide me with bread, etc. All the while these things were doing, you may be sure my thoughts ran many times upon the prospect of land which I had seen from the other side of the island, and I was not without secret wishes that I were on shore there, fancying that, seeing the mainland and an inhabited country, I might find some way or other to convey myself further, and perhaps at last find some means of escape. But all this while I made no allowance for the dangers of such an undertaking, 
and how I might fall into the hands of savages, and perhaps such as I might have reason to think far worse than the lions and tigers of Africa, that if I once came in their power I should run a hazard of more than a thousand to one of being killed, and perhaps of being eaten, for I had heard that the people of the Caribbean coast were cannibals or man-eaters, and I knew by the latitude that I could not be far from that shore. Then, supposing they were not cannibals, yet they might kill me, as many Europeans who had fallen into their hands had been served, even when they had been ten or twenty together. Much more I that was but one, and could make little or no defense. All these things, I say, which I ought to have considered well, and did come into my thoughts afterwards, yet gave me no apprehensions at first, and my head ran mightily upon the thought of getting over to the shore. Now I wish for my boy Shuri, and the long boat with the shoulder of mutton sail, with which I had sailed above a thousand miles on the coast of Africa. But this was in vain. Then I thought I would go and look at our ship's boat, which, as I have said, was blown up upon the shore a great way in the storm when we were first cast away. She lay almost where she did at first, but not quite, and was turned by the force of the waves and the winds almost bottom upward against a high ridge of beachy rough sand, but no water about her. If I had had hands to have refitted her and to have launched her into the water, the boat would have done well enough, but, and I might have gone back into the Brazils with her easily enough. Yet I might have foreseen that I could no more turn her and set her upright upon her bottom than I could remove the island. However, I went to the woods and cut levers and rollers and brought them to the boat, resolving to try what I could do, suggesting to myself that if I could turn her down, I might repair the damage she had received, and she would be a very good boat and I might go to sea in her very easily. I spared no pains, indeed, in this bit of fruitless toil, and spent, I think, three or four weeks about it, at last finding it impossible to heave it up with my little strength. I fell to digging away the sand to undermine it, and so to make it fall down, setting pieces of wood to thrust and guide it right in the fall. But when I had done this, I was unable to stir it up again, or to get under it, much less to move it forwards towards the water. So I was forced to give it over, and yet, though I gave over the hopes of the boat, my desire to venture over for the main increased, rather than decreased, as the means for it seemed impossible. This at length put me upon thinking whether it was not possible to make myself a canoe or periagua, such as the natives of those climates make, even without tools, or, as I might say, uh, without hands, of the trunk of a great tree. This I not only thought possible, but easy, and pleased myself extremely with the thoughts of making it, and with my having much more convenience for it than any of the Negroes or Indians, but not at all considering the particular inconveniences which I lay under more than the Indians, and that is, want of hands to move it when it was made into the water, a difficulty much harder for me to surmount than all the consequences of want of tools could be to them. For... What was it to me if, when I had chosen a vast tree in the woods, and with much trouble cut it down, if I had been able with my t tools to hew and dub the outside with the proper shape of a boat, and burn or cut out the inside to make it hollow, so as to make a boat of it, if, after all this, I must leave it just where I had found it, and not be able to launch it into the water? One would have thought... I could not have had the least reflection upon my mind of the circumstances while I was making this boat. But I should have immediately thought how I should get it into the sea, 
but my thoughts were so intent upon my voyage over the sea in it that I never once considered how I should get it off the land, and it was really in its own nature more easy for me to guide it over forty-five miles of sea than about forty-five fathoms of land where it lay to set it afloat in the water. I went to work upon this boat the most like a fool that ever man did who had any of his senses awake. I pleased myself with the design, and without determining whether I was ever able to undertake it. Not but that the difficulty of launching my boat came often into my head, but I put a stop to my inquiries into this by this foolish answer which I gave myself. Let me first make it. I warrant I will find some way or other to get it along when it is done. This was a most preposterous method, but the eagerness of my fancy prevailed, and to work I went. I found a cedar tree, and I question much whether Solomon ever had such a one for the building of the temple of Jerusalem. It was five feet ten inches diameter at the lower part next to the stump, and four feet eleven inches diameter at the end of twenty-two feet, after which it lessened for a while, and then parted into branches. It was not without infinite labor that I felled this tree. I was twenty days hacking and hewing at it at the bottom. I was fourteen more getting the branches and limbs and the vast spreading head cut off, which I hacked and hewed through with axe and hatchet, and inexpressible labor. After this it cost me a month to shape it and dub it to a proportion, and to something like the bottom of a boat, that it might swim upright as it ought to. It cost me near three months more to clear the inside and work it out so as to make it an exact boat. This I did, indeed, without fire, by mere mallet and chisel, and by the dint of hard labor, till I had brought it to be a very handsome periagua, and big enough to have carried six and twenty men, and consequently big enough to have carried me and all my cargo. When I had gone through this work, I was extremely delighted with it. The boat was really much bigger than ever I saw a canoe or periagua that was made of one tree in my life. Many a weary stroke it had cost, you can be sure, and had I gotten it into the water, I make no question, but I should have begun the maddest voyage and the most unlikely to be performed that ever was undertaken. But all my devices to get it into the water failed me, though they cost me infinite labor too. It lay about one hundred yards from the water, and not more, but the first inconvenience was it was uphill towards the creek. Well, to take away this discouragement, I resolved to dig into the surface of the earth, and so make a declivity. This I began, and it cost me a prodigious deal of pains, but who grudge pains who have their deliverance in view? But when this was worked through, and this difficulty managed, it was still much the same, for I could no more stir the canoe than I could the other boat. Then I ventured the distance of ground and resolved to cut a dock or canal to bring the water up to the canoe, seeing I could not bring the canoe down to the water. Well, I began this work, and when I had begun to enter upon it and calculate how deep it was to be dug, how broad, how the stuff was to be thrown out, I found that by the number of hands I had, being none but my own, it must have been ten or twelve years before I could have gone through with it. For the shore lay so high that at the upper end it must have been at least twenty feet deep. And so, at length, but with great reluctancy, I gave this attempt over also. Uh, this grieved me heartily. And now I saw, though too late, the folly of beginning a work before we count the cost, 
and before we judge rightly of our own strength to go through with it. In the middle of this work I finished my fourth year in this place, and kept my anniversary with the same devotion, and with as much comfort as ever before, for, by a constant study and serious application of the word of God, and by the assistance of his grace, I gained a different knowledge from what I had before. I entertained different notions of things. I looked now upon the world as a thing remote, which I had nothing to do with, no expectations from, and indeed no desires about. In a word, I had nothing indeed to do with it, nor was ever likely to have. So I thought it looked, as we may perhaps look upon it hereafter, that is, as a place I had lived in, but was come out of it, and well might I say, as Father Abraham to dives, between me and thee is a great gulf fixed. In the first place, I was removed from all the wickedness of the world here. I had neither the lusts of the flesh and the lusts of the eye, nor the pride of life. I had nothing to covet, for I had all that I was now capable of enjoying. I was lord of the whole manor, or, if it pleased, I might call myself king or emperor over the whole country which I had possession of. There were no rivals. I had no competitor, none to dispute sovereignty or command me. I might have raised shiploadings of corn, but I had no use for it. So I let as little grow as I thought enough for my occasion. I had tortoise or turtle enough, but now and then one was as much as I could put to any use. I had timber enough to have built a fleet of ships, and I had grapes enough to have made wine or to have cured into raisins, to have loaded that fleet when it had been built. But all I could make use of was all that was valuable. I had enough to eat and supply my wants, and what was all the rest to me? If I killed more flesh than I could eat, the dog must eat it, or vermin. If I sowed more corn than I could eat, it must be spoiled. The trees that I cut down were lying to rot on the ground. I could make no more use of them but for fuel, and that I had no occasion for but to dress my food. In a word, the nature and experience of things dictated to me, upon just reflection, that all the good things of this world are no farther good to us than they are for our use, and that whatever we may heap up to give others, we enjoy just as much as we can use, and no more. The most covetous, gripping miser in the world would have been cured of the vice of covetousness if he had been in my case. For I possessed infinitely more than I knew what to do with. I had no room for desire, except it was of things which I had not, and they were but trifles, though indeed of great use to me. I had, as I hinted before, a parcel of money, as well gold as silver, about thirty-six pounds sterling. Alas, there the sorry, useless stuff lay. I had no more manner of business for it. And often, though with myself, that I would have given a handful of it for a gross of tobacco pipes, or for a hand mill to grind my corn, Nay, I would have given it all for a sixpenny worth of turnip and carrot seed out of England, <laughs> or for a handful of peas and beans and a bottle of ink. As it was, I had not the least advantage by it or benefit from it, but there it lay in a drawer, 
and grew moldy with the damp of the cave in the wet seasons. And if I had had the drawer full of diamonds, it had been the same case. <laughs> they had been of no manner of value to me, because of no use. I had now brought my state of life to be much easier in itself than it was at first and much easier to my mind as well as to my body. I frequently sat down to meet with thankfulness, and admired the hands of God's providence, which had thus spread my table in the wilderness. I learned to look more upon the bright side of my condition, and less upon the dark side, and to consider what I enjoyed rather than what I wanted. And this gave me sometimes such secret comforts that I cannot express them, and which I take notice of here, to put these discontented people in my mind of it, who cannot enjoy comfortably what God has given them, because they see and covet something that he has not given them. All our discontents about what we want appeared to me to spring from the want of thankfulness for what we have. Another reflection was of great use to me, and doubtless would be so to anyone that would fall into such distress as mine was. And this was to compare my present condition with what I at first expected it would be, nay, with what it would certainly have been if the good providence of God had not wonderfully ordered the ship to be cast up near to the shore, where I not only could come at her, but could bring what I got out of her to the shore, for my relief and comfort, without which I had wanted for tools to work, weapons for defense, and gunpowder and shot for getting my food. I spent whole hours, I, I may say whole days, in representing to myself in the most lively colors how I would have acted if I had got nothing out of the ship, how I could not have so much as got any food, except fish and turtles, and that, as it was long before I found any of them, I must have perished first, that I should have lived, if I had not perished, like a mere savage, that if I had killed a goat or a fowl by any contrivance, I had no way to flay or open it, or part the flesh from the skin and the bowels, or to cut it up, but must gnaw it with my teeth, and pull it with my claws, like a beast. These reflections made me very sensible of the goodness of providence to me, and very thankful of my present condition, with all its hardships and misfortunes, and this part also I cannot but recommend to the reflection of those who are apt in their misery to say, Is any affliction like mine? Let them consider how much worse the cases of some people are, and their case might have been if providence had thought fit. I had another reflection which assisted me also to comfort my mind with hopes, and this was comparing my present situation with what I had deserved, and had therefore reason to expect from the hand of providence. I had lived a dreadful life, perfectly destitute of the knowledge and fear of God. I had been well instructed by father and mother, neither had they been wanting to me in their early endeavors to infuse a religious awe of God into my mind, a sense of my duty, and what the nature and end of my being required of me. But, alas, falling early into the seafaring life, which of all lives is, is the most destitute of the fear of God, though his terrors are always before them, I say, falling early into the seafaring life and into seafaring company, all that little sense of religion which I had entertained was laughed out of me, by my messmates, by a hardened, 
despising of dangers, and the views of death, which grew habitual to me by my long absence from all manner of opportunities to converse with anything but was like myself, or to hear anything that was good or tended towards it. So void was I of everything that was good, or the least sense of what I was, or was to be that in the greatest deliverances I enjoyed, such as my escape from Sali, my being taken up by the Portuguese master of the ship, my being planted so well in the Brazils, my receiving the cargo from England, and the like, I never had once the words, Thank God, so much as on my mind, or in my mouth. Nor in the greatest distress had I so much as a thought to pray to him, or so much as to say, Lord, have mercy upon me. Nor to mention the name of God, no, unless it was to swear by and blaspheme it. I had terrible reflections upon my mind for many months, as I have already observed, on account of my wicked and hardened life past. And when I looked about me and considered what particular providences had attended me since my coming into this place, and how God had dealt bountifully with me, had not only punished me less than my iniquity had deserved, but had so plentifully provided for me, this gave me great hopes that my repentance was accepted, and that God had yet mercy in store for me. With these reflections I worked my mind up not only to a resignation to the will of God in the present disposition of my circumstances, but even to a sincere thankfulness for my condition, in that I, who was yet a living man, ought not to complain, seeing I had not the due punishment of my sins, that I enjoyed so many mercies which I had no reason to have expected in that place, that I ought never more to repine at my condition, but to rejoice, and to give daily thanks for that daily bread, which nothing but a crowd of wonders could have brought, that I ought to consider I had been fed even by a miracle, even as great as that of feeding Elijah by ravens, nay, by a, a long series of miracles that I could hardly have named a place in the uninhabitable part of the world where I could have been cast more to my advantage, a place where, as I had no society, which must was my affliction on one hand, so I found no ravenous beasts, no furious wolves or tigers to threaten my life, no venomous creatures or poisons which I might feed on to my hurt, no savages to murder and devour me. In a word, as my life was a life of sorrow one way, so it was a life of mercy another, and I wanted nothing to make it a life of comfort but to be able to make my sense of God's goodness to me and care over me in this condition be my daily consolation. And after I did make a just improvement of these things, I went away and was no more sad. I had now been here so long that many things which I had brought on shore for my help were either quite gone or very much wasted and near spent. My ink, as I observed, had been gone some time, all but a very little, which I eat out with water, a little and a little, till it was so pale it scarce left any appearance of black upon the paper. As long as it lasted, I made use of it to minute down the days of the month on which any remarkable thing happened to me, and 
First, by casting up times past, I remembered that there was a strange concurrence of days in the various providences which befell me, in which, if I had been superstitiously inclined to observe days as fatal or fortunate, I might have had reason to have looked upon with a great deal of curiosity. First, I had observed that the same day that I broke away from my father and friends and ran away to Hull in order to go to sea, the same day afterwards I was taken by the Salee man-of-war and made a slave. And the same day of the year that I escaped out of the wreck of that ship in Yarmouth Roads, that same day year afterwards I made my escape from Salee in a boat. The same day of the year I was born in, that is, the 30th of September. That same day I had my life so miraculously saved twenty-six years later, when I was cast on shore in this island, so that my wicked life and my solitary life began both on a day. The next thing to my ink being wasted was that of my bread, I mean the biscuit which I brought out of the ship, this I had husbanded to the last degree, allowing myself but one cake of bread a day for above a year. And yet I was quite without bread for near a year before I got any corn of my own, and great reason I had to be thankful that I had any at all, the getting it being, as has been already observed, next to miraculous. My clothes, too, began to decay, as to linen, I had found none a good while, except some checkered shirts which I found in the chests of the other seamen, and which I carefully preserved. Because many times I could bear no other clothes on but a shirt, and it was a very great help to me that I had, among all the men's clothes of the ship, almost three dozen of shirts. There were also indeed several thick watch coats of the seamen's which were left, but they were too hot to wear, and though it was true that the weather was so violently hot that there was no need of clothes, yet I could not go quite naked. No, though I had been inclined to it, which I was not. Nor could I abide the thought of it, though I was alone. The reason why I could not go naked was I could not bear the heat of the sun so well when quite naked as with some clothes on. Nay, the very heat blistered my skin, whereas with a shirt on the air itself made some motion, and whistling under the shirt was twofold cooler than without it. No more could I ever bring myself to go out in the heat of the sun without a cap on my head or a hat. The heat of the sun, beating with such violence as it does in that place, would give me the head ache presently, by darting so directly on my head without a cap or hat on, so that I could not bear it. Whereas, if I put on my hat, it would presently go away. Upon these views, I began to consider about putting the few rags I had, which I called clothes, into some order. I had worn out all the waistcoats I had, and my business was now to try if I could make jackets out of the great watch-coats which I had of me. But with such other materials as I had, I set to working, tailoring, or rather indeed botching, for I made most piteous work of it, However, I made shift to make two or three new waistcoats, which I hoped would serve me a great while. As for breeches and drawers, I made but a very sorry shift indeed till afterwards. I have mentioned that I saved the skins of all the creatures that I killed, I mean four-footed ones, and I hung them up, stretched out with sticks in the sun, by which means some of them were so dry and so hard that they were fit for little, but others were very useful. 
The first thing I made of these was a great cap for my head, with the hair on the outside to shoot off the rain. And this I performed so well, that after I made me a suit of clothes wholly of these skins, that is to say, a waistcoat and breeches open at the knees, and both loose, for they were rather wanting to keep me cool than to keep me warm, I must not admit to acknowledge that they were wretchedly made, for if I was a bad carpenter, I was a worse tailor. However, they were such as I made very good shift with. And when I was out, if it happened to rain, the hair of my waistcoat and cap being outermost, I was kept very dry. After this I spent a great deal of time and pains to make an umbrella. I was indeed in great want of one, and had a great mind to make one. I had seen them made in the Brazils, where they are very useful in the great heats there, and I felt the heats every jot as great here, and greater too, being near the equinox. Besides, as I was obliged to be much abroad, it was a most useful thing to me, as well for the rains as the heats. I took a world of pains with it, and was a great while before I could make anything likely to hold. Nay, after I had thought I had hit my way, I spoiled two or three before I made one to my mind. But at last I made one that answered indifferently well. The main difficulty I found was to make it let down. I could make it spread, but if I did not let down two and draw in, it was not portable for me anyway, but just over my head, which would not do. However, at last, as I said, I made one to answer and covered it with skins, the hair upwards so that it cast off the rain like a penthouse, and kept off the sun so effectually that I could walk out in the hottest of the weather with greater advantage than I could before in the coolest and when I had no need of it, could close it, and carry it under my arm. Thus I lived mighty comfortably, my mind being entirely composed by resigning itself to the will of God, and throwing myself wholly under the disposal of His providence. This made my life better than sociable, for when I began to regret the want of conversation, I would ask myself whether thus conversing mutually with my own thoughts and, as I hope I may say, with even God himself, by ejaculations was not better than the most enjoyment of human society in the world. End of chapter 9